uh, I will be talking more into the ETO pathogenesis of obesity, which is going to be a little, little difficult task for all of us to understand because we have never ever entered into this science very aggressively across. And someone has already said that uh, obesity, some enthusiastic speaker or author has mentioned uh, obesity as an as a endocrine tumor of adipose tissues. So I feel uh, we, are, we have underestimated obesity because, and we have a financial disclosure that this particular session has been sponsored by Novo Nordis. So I'll be talking more on physiology of the weight reduction regulation, some slides on etiopathogenesis of obesity, and the benefits of the weight loss and the concept of weight regain. Now, energy balance equation is very, very simple to understand. For lay people, we say, whatever you eat, you should be able to spend. If you don't do that, you will have obesity. Now, this concept is very easy to mention, easy to understand for a lay person. And behind that, we have hunger, satiety, and the nutrient absorption, which are important when you talk about, when you consider intake as a calorie. And expense, expenditure, you need to understand the metabolic rate. It could be the resting, it could be the, uh, uh, it could be some, uh, so the basal metabolic rate, thermogenesis, exercise, then the, you have the non-exercise uh, activity, thermogenesis, that is NEAT. So all these factors need to be considered when we talk about the expenditure versus the total food intake, which is simple to understand and simple to calculate by most of the dietitians. So energy balance means the energy intake minus energy expenditure. Ideally, it should be zero. And energy intake is simple, as I told you, whatever food you take, but energy expenditure has multiple components. We have our RMR, which is resting metabolic rate, which is in human is being referred to the energy required to sustain all essential physiological function of your body, which includes your, your breathing, your, respira your respiration, your heartbeats, your all muscle activity, your GI activity, everything is being included as a resting metabolic rate. Why am I emphasizing you this? Because we are going to understand the importance of this RMR in later phase of our uh, understanding in the last part when we'll try to cover why there is a rebound and why we are unable to sustain or maintain the weight loss we have done with all your efforts for six months or a year. So that will be, rem so please remember this terminology which is resting metabolic rate. Then the thermogenesis or DIT, thermogenesis or uh, maybe may of different kind, the psychological stress, the environment, the drugs, the diet induced the thermogenesis. When you take meal, your diet also takes some of the energy is being utilized for the metabolism of these, whether you take carbohydrate, fat, or, 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 or the protein, or whatever you take, ultimately it requires some energy, which is being covered as DIT. Then you have physical activity, where you again spend energy or utilize some, uh, some of the calories, which is non-exercise activ uh, activity, thermogenesis, which is neat which is being referred to the amount of energy which is being utilized uh, uh, through your physical activity, which includes your muscle tone, posture, balance, uh, fidgeting. Sometimes you have a habit of you know, moving your uh, leg like this. Even that is being counted, uh, which is not a very structured exercise, and that is why it is called as NEAT. But the exercise, when you say exercise-induced thermogenesis, is, is a structured exercise. Maybe it is walking, swimming, or any of the... Uh, sports you play. So all this, all this together will measure your total ex energy expenditure and you need to have a balance between the energy intake and the expenditure. Now there are different locations uh, in, your, in, your, uh, in your body which are, which are involved. You have different anorexigenic uh, uh, hormones or the peptide or orexigenic uh, uh, hormones or the peptides which are responsible for your food intake and your satiety as well as your hunger. Anorexigenic means you, you, don't, you have get anorexia of when, when you have these hormones being secreted and you get early satiety, your appetite is reduced. When you talk of orexigenic, that means it causes you hunger, you eat more. So you have few of the cent uh, locations. In the central, you have hypothalamus where you have the, uh, the uh, POMC, and some other oxytocin, serotonin, histamine, urocortin, 
GI Trek, our main focus will be on GLP-1, okay. but you have the uh, uh, polypeptide YY or, or, or the oxenotomodium and then some other uh, GI tract uh, peptides which are also responsible and we are, they are anorexinic hormone. Pancreatic, we have pancreatic peptide, we have insulin and amylin which again reduces uh, your appetite and the adipose, adipocyte which is leptin. So you have different uh, body organs which are involved in the, in the system and when you talk about orexogenic, the main hormone here is a ghrelin hormone which is also called as uh, hunger hormone and then you have uh, neuropeptide PY and uh, uh, you have uh, the uh, AGRP and MCH and opioids and endocannabinoids. So these are various uh, peptides which are responsible to reduce, your, to increase your hunger. Now the ap appetite regulation, you have some peripheral signals which modulate the appetite and energy expenditure via the hypothalamus. I'll not go too much into, into the detail, uh, detail of this, but you have the uh, arcuate nucleus and the hypothalamus in the center, and then you have the, uh, the pro-opio uh, melanocortin uh, and, and, the, uh, and the cocaine and amphetamine uh, uh, regulated transcripts. Now POMC is a hormone which is anorexic hormone. Here you have PYY, PP, GLP-1, especially GLP-1, which will actually stimulate POMC as a first order neuron. And then you have ghrelin, which will be responsible to stimulate the NPY and the, uh, and the uh, agouti related protein. And then you have leptin and insulin, which will have a positive impact on the POMC and CART, while the negative on the uh, NPY. And from there then, they will be responsible to stimulate the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the MCR3, the receptor 3 and 4, to improve your satiety. While, and it will improve, uh, it will reduce your satiety, uh, appetite and improve the satiety. Now for hunger, you'll have the stimulation from the ghrelin, which again through MP, uh, uh, n uh, uh, n NPY, and there will also be a role of brain, st brain stem, where nucleus tractus solitaris and the area post -trema, here you have vagal stimuli and the amylin and GLP-1 analog, which GLP-1 pe peptide, which will be actually re responsible for reducing your appetite, improving your satiety, and uh, and helping you to reduce your to um, ha to reduce your appetite and uh, reduce your hunger and imp uh, and 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 maintain the weight. Now this particular regulation is a little complex. To make simple, little, uh, to make the things little simple, we have three different ways which will be responsible for your eating behavior. And brain actually controls them. So we have one is homeostatic eating, that is eating for hunger. This is the, uh, this is the behavior which is being controlled by the hypothalamus, which I told you earlier. You have the GLP-1, PYY, OXM, polypeptide P amylin, which increases your satiety. And you have ghrelin, which increases your hunger. Then you have the hedonic eating, where eating for pleasure. Eating for hunger is like when you are empty stomach for a long period, you are feeling hungry, that is eating for hunger, which will be taken care by the hypothalamus. Hedonic eating is basically uh, basically an uh, area where you, you, you feel good. Suppose if I had been to a temple today, the Simva temple, Narsimha temple, where I have been offered a uh, some, uh, my wife has uh, got some, her got, she got some uh, laddu there. Now, if I am a laddu lover and my hedonic response will say, okay, you have the full laddu. Uh, though, I, though I had good breakfast in the morning, but they will say, you have full laddu. And if my hedonic eating is not in favor of the laddu, possibly I will not eat it. Now, presume that I have a, I have a love or affection for those laddu. But then, and this, this particular response uh, is, being made, is being taken by, by do, dopamine, which actually controls your wanting. Someone wants to have it. While the opioid and cannabinoids receptors, they control the liking. So there is a difference between wanting and, and, and liking. Wanting means you want it. Like means you like it, but you need not be, uh, need not be too much for it. And here comes the role of an execu executive function where what, is what do you decide to eat? 
So if the laddu is in front of me, if my brain decides, no, it's too much of calorie, though I like it, and my brain, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, your, uh, uh, your frontoparietal uh, co cortex has said that, okay, okay, Dr. Gupta, you all, you, though you love it, but you're already overweight, so better you already had good breakfast, the, you can just have a, have a you know, small bite being a prashad, you can have it. So, that's, this, so this, is a, this is called a behavior which is being controlled by your, uh, uh, by your cortex. So you have thought, behavior and feeling, all of these are going to decide about your eating for hunger, eating for pleasure and deciding to eat. On the basis of your habits and behavior, your, your brain is being regulated since childhood. So behavioral intervention empower the sustainable behavior in controlling the eating. Let's see the etiopathogenesis of it. So energy intake, energy expenditure, and you have, which is all being dictated by your brain, but there are different inputs which are coming from adipose tissues, the pancreas, the gut, I already told you the different hormones coming from leptin here. Here you have amylene and, and insulin, your gut hormones like GLP-1, genetic and environment and medications might al also play a big, big role. And then you have, you are being influenced by the hedonic inputs, which increases the pal palatability or the pleasure, and the environmental uh, risk factors like uh, passive lifestyle or smoking or psychological factors. We have some data to share about, about the genetics, uh, the high er heritability of the body weight genes in the hypothalamus, leptin, melatonocortin pathways, and uh, and, and this is a data which has come from 334,000 individuals where they have seen that the BMI related genes are expressed maximum in the nervous system. Environment, I won't go into detail of it, but we have our own traditions, beliefs, socioeconomic factors which are responsible. Benefit of the weight loss. Now, obesity associated with multiple complications, metabolic, mechanical, and mental. You have asthma, NAFLD. Uh, gallstone, infertility, sub-infertility, hypogonadism, polycystic ovarian disease, pregnancy-related complications, you have cancers, cardiovascular disease, stroke, dyslipidemia, hypertension, coronary artery disease, pulmonary embolism, type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, thrombosis, gout, and you have mechanical problems, uh, you can have functional uh, disability, urinary incontinence, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, chronic back syndrome, and mental disorders. And if you just reduce by your, your weight by 5 to 10 percent, you will be able to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular mortality, uh, lipid profile can improve, blood pressure, severity of obstetric sleep apnea. I feel the six minutes less have been taken by Jyoti Dev. I'll take two or three minutes out of it. He stopped six minutes early. I'll just finish up in one or two, two three slides. So greater weight loss, uh, if you have more than 5 to 10 to 10 to 15 percent, you'll have another weight loss, uh, uh, another benefits of, of these complications. But despite you weight, this is a data which says six months trial where you have tremendous weight loss, but up in, uh, they have been followed for almost eight different studies. They have been followed for a minimum three years and they found the rebound phenomena. Almost every trial has shown the weight has again, uh, uh, their rebound or relapse. And here, here it comes, ki why you are again going to go for regain? And we ha have a set point in your hypothalamus which needs, which it's very difficult to change. So these are various factors which does not allow you to, uh, to go for the adaptation and, and they go, they try to go back to the, to the previous weight. Again, because of want of time, there's the last uh, uh, one or two slide, the persistent metabolic adaptation. Very interesting, 16 participants which have, who have, who have participated in the biggest uh, weight loser uh, reality show. And out of them, 14 have, have, been, have been followed. This is a 30 weeks uh, they have been participated. And the mean weight loss of 58 kg. But within few years, within six years follow up, they regained 48 kg, 44, uh, 41 kg weight, uh, weight. But the resting metabolic rate also reduced and the metabolic adaptation also reduced. That's why there is regain. So finally, this is my last slide, Amit. Uh, <laughs> Energy balance is regulated by the brain through various sources of inputs. We already seen it. There are different inputs here. Brain controls appetite by regulating these three types of eating, hedonic, uh, uh, homeostatic, and the, and the uh, execution. And the maintenance of the weight loss is challenging due to the met metabolic adaptation that your, your system, your brain doesn't allow you to remain in, in a lost weight. And it doesn't, it, it brings you back to the uh, to your original way th uh, through various mechanisms that we have seen. With this, I stop here. Thank you very much for patience listening.
thank you, Dr. Sunil Gupta. Uh, now, since uh, we now know what is the impact of the weight, and we also now are wiser in knowing the science behind the obesity, so Dr. Jyoti Dev will now talk about how to assess the obesity, what uh, what is the grading, and how the staging is done, and then he will walk us through one case scenario uh, when, in which he will uh, talk about the obesity management also. Okay, done. So thanks to uh, Dr. Amit Gupta, thanks to uh, Sunil. So uh, Dr. Sunil has discussed the science of obesity and in the next 10 minutes, we will discuss on how we can assess obesity. It's very important, how to diagnose obesity. So probably many of us will be of the notion that we are all diagnosing obesity and that is how obesity need to be diagnosed. But there are certain limitations to what we are used to for many decades. That is exactly what we are going to discuss now. So what are we going to do with the person sitting in front of us? First is diagnosis. Are we doing it properly? I am not certain about it. We need to be more certain and sure about diagnosing obesity with science, with emerging evidence. I think the second step is also very, very difficult. Rather than important, it is difficult to discuss that somebody is having obesity. And the language matters, you have to be very polite, you cannot scare. I cannot tell him that uh, it's all because you are eating more, you are not exercising. So such types of behaviors from a doctor should not be there. So the discussion part and how to have a conversation with the person with obesity is extremely important. And that will decide on whether you are successful in treating him or not. So all the three steps are of equal significance. And let us start with diagnosis because that is where I'm going to focus tonight. Diagnosis of obesity. So we have a traditional approach by which you are going to measure the body mass index. And now you have emerging evidence from USS. And USS I'll be discussing in detail because that is probably more important for us. And uh, we are all used to the traditional way of diagnosing obesity with body mass index and uh, probably many of us are going to be either overweight or obese all of us sitting here in this uh, particular hall if we are measuring the height and the body weight and that is weight in kilograms divided by height in meter squared so let me dissect and all these numbers are known to you this it is only a recap for you and for the indian standards these are the parameters for india a bmi above 25 is considered as obese and for waist circumference, men and women, 90 and 80 centimeters respectively. And waist hip ratio, almost same numbers, 0.9 and 0.8, diagnostic of obesity. And body fat percentage, if you have a device or if you are using some investigations, if men above 25%, women above 30%, can be regarded as having obesity. And you can also grade, you can also I have a grading of obesity and these are the Indian standards recently published by Nihal Thomas, Nidin Kapoor and the group uh, in one of the recent journals and this is in 2018. Up to 18.5 is underweight and then up to 22.9 is normal weight and overweight starts from 23. And you have three classes of obesity, 25, then 30 and above 35. So remember these numbers. So now, are all the so-called normal weight people having normal weight or not? The answer is no. The answer is a big no, because all of those who are regarded as having normal weight need not have a normal weight obesity. They can, it can even be regarded as a normal weight obesity, and this can be 8 to 15 percent of those people whom you are diagnosing as having a normal weight. And uh, I think Dr. Anjana is here and she is going to have a lecture soon after this and they are having a, remember, reviewing that paper from your center on metabolically obese and uh, uh, unhealthy and healthy obesity. And that is again an uh, emerging concept. So if you are having a BMI, which is normal or above normal, overweight or obese, there can be a subclass of those individuals with normal weight having metabolically unhealthy normal weight. So you can have a normal BMI of 22, but still you can have excess visceral fat and you can be a person who is having 
low lean mass, that means you can be a person having sarcopenia, low muscle mass, and these are those individuals having high inflammatory markers, prone for cancers, multiple cancers, which we discussed in the beginning in the introduction, pancreatic cancers, endometrial cancers, breast cancer, multiple myeloma, and so on, and the same risk is there in metabolically unhealthy people with obesity. So, the so-called obese individuals, 8 to 10 percent can be even metabolically healthy. So, BMI will have lot of limitations. BMI will have lot of limitations when you are only considering BMI in your clinical practice because it is very easy. I know that many of you, including me, we are all assessing BMI in your clinics. We will measure the height and during every visit to the hospital, we will be measuring the weight of the person and we will be documenting in the computer, in the electronic medical records. But there are a lot of limitations using only body mass index. Reason being, we are not considering the concomitant illnesses. We are not considering whether the person is having any pain, whether the person is having any mobility issues. We are not considering the fact whether the person is having any type 2 diabetes or any cancers. We are not considering whether the obese individual is having depression, very important, mental depression. And changes in the BMI or waist circumference are not reflecting the functional status of the individual. So the functional status of the individual will have a significance in deciding, in deciding the therapy because you need not implement a therapy for all of those people who are obese. So it is time, my dear friends, to move beyond obesity. It is time to move beyond just measuring the body mass index. And what is the solution? The solution, the easiest solution now with us is to accept, to adopt the EOSS, and that is the Edmonton Obesity Staging System. And I am pretty sure that most of you are familiar with this, but those of you who are not familiar, let me tell you, it is very, very simple. It is extremely simple to use EOSS in your practice. You require only the assistance of your diabetes educator to classify. And this is a staging system where <coughs> we are using three parameters. One is medical and the second is mental, and the third is functional. So, what is stage zero? Stage zero means everything is normal. No medical conditions apart from the person being diagnosed as obese, according to BMI. And the mental status is normal, and functionally also, the person is normal. And stage one is preclinical. There are mild symptoms of depression. There are mild issues with mobility. Or there can be pre-hypertension or pre-diabetes. And the stage 2 will be moderate. The presence of moderate disability, whereas stage 3 is end organ damage. There is a chronic kidney disease. Or there is osteoarthritis. And that is severe. And the stage 4, of course, we as physicians or we as doctors will have a lot of challenges managing stage 4 because that is the end stage of obesity where either of these components, so I repeat, Either of these will probably help you in assessing or putting them in one stage. For example, if there is a moderate mental involvement, then that person will qualify for stage 2 of EOSS. So long ago, there is a validation for EOSS and that was with the help of the enhanced data from 1988 to 1994 and they have compared BMI with EOSS. So this is BMI over there and this is EOSS and up to stage 3, because stage 4 is anyway disability and uh, it is irreversible. And it is difficult for the NH hands to have a validation. So what they have found is, look at these numbers and the curves. Stage 0, then 1, 2, and this is stage 3 of USS. And when you are comparing with BMI, BMI, all those stages, they look almost the same. But when you are comparing the same with USS, it is clearly depicting, it is clearly correlating with prediction of mortality. So when you are considering the functional status of the person, when you are considering the mental status of the person, when you are considering the multiple other comorbidities, along with BMI, it is closely correlating with, it is directly correlating with the prediction of mortality in the population. So this is Similar to comparing hemoglobin A1C 
with percentage time in range metrics. So you have the continuous glucose monitoring data where even when the A1C is same for four people, when you are performing a CGM, the TAR metrics will be entirely different for those with the same hemoglobin A1C. Likewise, likewise, you may have people in the same class of obesity based on body mass index. But when you are subclassifying or when you are categorizing based on EUSS, the same BMI class will have multiple of these components. 64% of them having stage 3. 14% of them stage 0 this much. So that is something which is alarming and that is something probably very interesting for us to adopt so that we are classified and based on the EOSS staging system we can decide on whether we need to go only for a primordial prevention or you need to have behavioral therapies or you can implement medical or surgical therapies or interventions based on the EUSS staging system. So I will stop in another one minute this particular module and this is a couple of examples on how the BMI compares with because the entire uh, topic of discussion is BMI versus the new EUSS staging system. So this is a 24 year old physically active female. So assuming that she is still beautiful, despite a BMI of 32, very active, with no demonstrable risk factors, very important, no demonstrable risk factors. So based on BMI, it is class two or grade two based on BMI, but based on EUSS, since no other medical, mental, or pa other parameters are there, it is stage zero of obesity. So you are not going to do anything. So this is a girl, whom you probably can implement some primordial prevention and there won't be any additional health benefits giving her any therapies. And moving on to another case, and this is a 32 year old male where the BMI is 36 and there are diseases. There is sleep apnea, there is depression. So here it is stage two of obesity and it is class three based on BMI and treatment will have benefits. And here this 63 year old male with a BMI of 54, that is class three of obesity with severe disability. So this is stage four of obesity where there'll be multiple challenges if you are planning for a management. Because as you can see, it is almost in stage. It is almost in stage and he's bound wheelchair. And here you may have to have multiple strategies and the BMI alone in this case won't be helpful at all. So in conclusion, you need to move beyond BMI. You need to move beyond BMI in assessing obesity based on the functional status of the individual, based on mental and physical capabilities and functionality. And you know, in diabetes and in medicine and in obesity, doctor is least important now. Medical insurances are least important. The person with the disease is at the centric and is at the center. And these attempts, classifying obesity based on EUSS will help you with a patient centric approach in addressing obesity. So shall we move on to the next one? Yeah. One case, one case. So I'll be discussing the first case and the second case will be discussed by Dr. Sunil Gupta. So this is going to be an interactive case to base approach, but because of the time constraints, I don't think it can be interactive, but if you can be interactive, let us see. Hmm? <laughs> so uh, this is the overall theme. And uh, this clinical approach, you remember Dr. Sunil Gupta discussing about the various factors leading to obesity. And whenever there is a weight gain and a weight loss, there is always a tendency to regain weight. So here is a person, a 63 year old male. So imagine that he is there in your clinic a prototype of a person visiting your hospital with a BMI of 42. Of course, we all have such people visiting us with end organ damage such as osteoarthritis. He has got pain over there. He has plantar fasciitis and he has sleep apnea. He has pre-diabetes. So he has a lot of complications and consequences secondary to obesity. And he has attempted multiple uh, weight loss programs and he has probably been successful in reducing around 10 kilograms. Is he exercising? 
he is trying to exercise but very little daily only 10 to 15 minutes but that you only 3 or 5 days a week and he describes himself as a foodie he is traveling a lot and the family history is also contributory because there are more than 100 factors genetic factors contributing to obesity and that is also probably contributory there is positive family history to obesity and multiple other consequences and he has attempted treatment with other medications anti obesity medications that is aom but not effective dr sulingapta has described about the reasons for obesity the r5 nucleus the agouti related protein the glp1 the satiety hormone the ghrelin so multiple factors and all of them culminating in multiple disabilities so he has the pain of osteoarthritis he has the pain of a uh, pain of plantar fasciitis he has sleep apnea so now how are you going to break this cycle but before that this is the life history of a person with obesity and most of the time this is similar in most of our patients soon after high school soon after college having a job and then suddenly there is a increase in the body weight and then with diet they may be successful in losing the weight and subsequently they will again start gaining weight so this is a cycle losing weight and gaining weight and ultimately at the end of the marriage he is again now with weight gain but there now there is a roadblock now he is there with weight gain and unable to even move around so we need to break this cycle we need to break this cycle of chronic pain because obesity is a disease where there are multiple reasons for chronic pain and this guy sunil 43 years has pain of arthritis he has pain of osteoarthritis of the knee and then plantar fasciitis cervical spondylosis and because of the pain of course there will be depression there is fear of movement he cannot move around so there is negative self efficacy and all these are contributing to the inflammatory factors and also the depression so what about this uh, evidence so far the evidence so far even for mild to moderate or even for modest weight loss let us consider 11% weight loss this 11% weight loss whatever be the reason for the weight loss or however he is losing the weight that will contribute to significant changes improvements in the pain of osteoarthritis significant improvement in stiffness and this is the overall improvement let us review the data from the step clinical trial step is the clinical development program where the injectable semaglutide 2.4 mg once weekly is compared against placebo and some of these clinical trials have been done in india as well so when you are comparing the three cohorts here those with more than or equal to 15% weight loss because with injectable semaglutide our people with obesity can have robust weight loss because it is capable of inducing huge weight loss and if you look at these people with greater weight loss it is also directly correlating with higher the weight loss better the improvement in physical functioning so that is a direct correlation so what are the solutions available in india the solutions available in india of course liraglutide is available but not at approved for weight loss but still many of us we are all using it for weight loss therapies the 3 mg as a off label indication orlistat very difficult minimal but with side effects and we have one more drug which is approved i don't know whether you are aware of the fact that injectable semaglutide is approved in india it is a medication which is approved by cdso in india and this is a once weekly injectable but not at launched in our country it is a blockbuster drug in many many other countries once weekly injectable semaglutide 2.4 mg and the trade name is begovi and our guy but before that what are the indications in india we have those with bmi more than or equal to 30 or 27 or more with other comorbidities that is indication for a weight loss drug in india based on multiple other studies because we don't have an india specific study for our indian bmi standards so our guy was lucky and he went for a therapy in a clinical trial he was enrolled in a clinical trial where he received once weekly 2.4 milligrams of injectable semaglutide 
and he was successful in losing 16%. So that amounts to around 18 kilograms for him. So there was an 18 kilograms uh, uh, weight loss for him at the end of the clinic, towards the end of the clinic, you can see that there was a sustainable improvement in the weight. During the course of period when he was enrolled in the clinical trial and he was actually about to have a knee surgery. Remember, he is having osteoarthritis affecting both the knee. But by the time he was getting prepared, the clinical trial stopped. <laughs> and uh, th th that is something which is a mystery there. And the moment, you remember Dr. Sunil Gupta discussing in the beginning, the moment the medication was stopped, he started gaining weight again. So this is a step one extension trial where it is compared with placebo. With You can see there is a steady reduction in the body weight and this is beyond the clinical trial when gradually, gradually, and this happens with any weight loss medication or with any weight loss trial whether it is a diet or an exercise, whatever be the modality for a weight loss, this happens. So now the question to the audience is, what is the solution for? Because the person is in front of you and uh, he need to go for a surgery for his knee with osteoarthritis and he need to reduce the weight further. But this medication is no longer available. Uh, probably he also cannot afford the medication even if, when it is available in India. I don't know. This is a hypothetical situation. So these are the three choices for you. Number one, restart AOM, that is anti-obesity medication, until the BMI is 25. Restart the anti-obesity medication, BMI is around 42. Continue weight management, but without any medications. That is the third choice. So can I invite some responses from the audience, please? Because it is supposed to be an interactive lecture. Before continue weight management without AM. Pardon? So that is one response without AM. Uh, but here the challenge is he has tried multiple other modalities for weight loss earlier. And he is also having end organ damage and he is almost bound to the wheelchair. And without AOM, there is a, he is having limited capacity to exercise as well. Yes, please, sir. So restart AOM. To restart AOM? Yes. First is until BMI falls 25. Okay, that is one. Sridhar, sir? Yeah. Your comments will be very valuable. Sir, you can speak even without mic. Or you can come here, sir. Yeah. No, but your speech yeah. is exciting. <coughs> Obesity is a chronic disease, just like hypertension or diabetes. So there's nothing like s stopping the treatment. Science may say that you have to stop it after one year or two years or whatever. Like you give the off-label uh, uh, use of semaglutide for weight loss, we'll have to try to continue it as long as it is possible. So there may not be much of science behind it, but if you want to induce the weight loss or make the patient lose weight, we'll have to use it as long as it is possible. This is at least uh, some of the uh, bariatric specialists, they say that think of obesity as a lifelong disease. And like all lifelong diseases, it needs lifelong management. And you yourself mentioned that uh, lifestyle measures are effective up to a point. And once you stop the drugs, the weight is regained. So it's a cash 22 situation. We don't have much of choice, but we try to use it as much as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the inputs. Very valuable inputs and very valuable suggestions. Anything else? Say, uh, next, next, okay, I will conclude. So uh, here the, uh, the answer here is, uh, with uh, uh, anti-obesity medications and restarting them, it will be almost impossible to reach a BMI of 25. Uh, because we need to be realistic, going by the SMART goals of current therapies, you need to be 
it need to be achievable and we need to be realistic and here the only a solution will be to restart anti obesity medication and as you know uh, the oral semaglutide which is available in our country that is ribelsus is approved for treating diabetes and the double the dose of the same medication is approved globally for uh, weight loss the injectable once weekly the smaller doses are for diabetes and that is also big globally and once weekly 2.4 mg is approved for the treatment of obesity globally and in india also it is approved but the medication is currently not launched in india because of the high global demand it is getting delayed so here what they have done is they have restarted the anti obesity medication and the person again started losing weight so the uh, take home message is we need to have multiple strategies along with medications as i said the behavioral modifications diet and exercise so i stop here and uh, moving thank on to you. the next case so thank next, you very much the next case will be taken by dr sunil gupta he will tell us about this chest pain has made me think about tackling my weight yeah. so i'll be very brief uh, on this case uh, management of obesity and its complication an interactive case based discussion this chest pain has made me think about uh, tackling about my weight i feel the focus is towards uh, uh, towards the macroangiopathy so we have Ash ashok 62 year old man and uh, his uh, uh, bmi is 40 and his 130 kg weight pre diabetes hypertension coronary artery disease osteoarthritis two previous attempts of weight loss uh, uh, at best achieving maximum of 5% reduction uh, weight loss has never been sustained uh, has not previously been interested in discussing other forms of treatment of obesity till coronary artery or till he got chest pain which was diagnosed as angina now he got motivated and he said that now he would like to have a have a weight loss through lifestyle modification he could reduce a by four percent now he explores further options now question to audiences which obesity related complication do you encounter most commonly in in patient with obesity i feel i'll not waste much time but we have uh, the uh, this additive risk of type 2 diabetes in obesity and pre-diabetes is coronary artery disease if you just have obesity the risk of developing type 2 diabetes around five percent if you just have pre-diabetes the risk of developing type 2 diabetes around 6.7 percent but you have if you have diabetes as well as uh, pre-diabetes as well as obesity then the risk of developing diabetes almost 17.4 percent and the coronary artery disease, cerebral vascular disease, marked infarction in pre-diabetes and diabetes, I feel I don't need to go in detail of it because every one of you know, knows that pre-diabetics as well as people with type 2 diabetes are uh, known to have higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Now the effect of weight loss, uh, uh, if you have 0 to 5% weight loss, you tackle hypertension tri uh, and hyperglycemia. If you have 5 to 10% weight loss, the prevent, uh, you can have prevention of type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, PCOs, and dyslipidemia. 10 to 15% weight loss. Most of the studies, they expect you to be at least 5%, and 5 to 10%, most of them, they achieve. But if, if you have 10 to 15% of the base weight loss, cardiovascular disease, urinary stress, incontinence, NASH, they have observed that fa the, the fat in the, in the hepatic cells, intrahepatic cells, have found to be less. NASH, they have seen the uh, reduce reduction in the fibrosis uh, in, in the liver and then of, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, GERD and knee or, uh, osteoarthritis. And if you have more than 15% weight loss, what we have seen in the injectable semaglutide, then you have seen type 2 diabetes remission, cardiovascular mortality and hospitalization for heart failure. So you have changed from the baseline at 104 weeks of semaglutide versus placebo. You have waste, uh, waste uh, circumference, systolic blood pressure, C-reactoprotein, triglyceride, all were statistically significantly lower uh, in, in patient with uh, 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 versus placebo. And there's a look ahead trial where they have seen type, uh, subject with type 2 diabetes. MACE is reduced when you have the, uh, when you have the uh, weight reduction of, of more than 10% versus less than 10 percent so if you have that more than 10 percent reduction of weight you end up with having the benefit in the coronary artery disease and there are multiple trials of uh, various uh, uh, various glp1 agonist and if you see here sustain 6 seems to have 
uh, uh, numbers higher versus others, but overall uh, they have shown that there is a CV benefit in these uh, group. I feel this is the this is possibly the last slide that you have some uh, trial which is already in plan where you have a CV outcome trial in patient with overweight and obesity and cardiovascular disease may or may not have diabetes and they have two arm 2.54 milligram of SEMA versus placebo and it's an event driven trial and the primary outcome is going to be first occurrence of maize, secondary is going to be re, uh, re, uh, uh, randomization to cardiovascular death and all cause death. I feel this trial is going to be coming in future. Thank you, Thank you very much and as I promised to chairperson I'll try to finish up well in time. Thank you very much. If you have any questions they are welcome. Thank you very much.